Amen. Well, second service, are you ready for God's word? Well, I, I tell you what, um, I believe you've, you've come to the right place for blessing because God put this message on my heart. It's a very practical message. I'm going to share the one I shared in first service because the Holy Spirit moved and, and, I, and I hadn't planned on some of it. And so it just, it, it, it was just uh, inspired after Pastor Melissa shared the brief testimony about our early years. And we've been, we've been a church now for, I think we're, we're coming up on 20 years we've been a church. Some of us have been here uh, and, and have been a part of Foundation since we were back in the school. Some have come since we've, we've moved out and transitioned to the campus. But we are blessed. How many of you know we're blessed? We have, as a church, I want you to know how God has is, is uniquely positioned us for the future. He has given us right here on, this, on, this, uh, on these grounds 37 acres. We've got frontage property. We have all this property back here. We have more property back behind us. We're, we're positioned to grow. God has put us here uniquely between Austin and Bastrop, one of the busiest intersections in the county. And I can remember when we first started, we, we hit our very first service. It was 32 people. So this is much like that first service. Uh, you might say, Pastor, that's not bad. 32 people, first service. But you got to realize something. This is before church planting was cool. The, you know, church planting was, was like not a thing. We just knew God called us to plant a church. We changed our jobs and we did it. You know, the Bible says go quickly and fulfill your vow to the Lord before you change your mind. And so when I felt called, I said, I got to do this quick, or what happens? You start to kind of get into life, and you start putting it off, and one, one week turns into a month, turns into a year, turns into a lifetime. And so I decided, we're going to do this. Let's do it now. And so first week, 32 people showed up. What I didn't realize is the second week that's the hard one. Because friends and family come out, and they see you off, and they cheer, and they say, awesome, you're stepping out in faith. But then they go back to their churches. And then the next week, you're left with, like, your family. And my family was smaller back then. It was, it was us three right here. And since then, God has added you guys and my darling children, Evelyn and Joshua, who were up here. Joshua um, was, was, uh, had a birthday yesterday, so he celebrates his birthday. Best Valentine's Day gift I ever received from my wife was uh, my son on the 13th, 17 years ago. And then uh, happy Valentine's Day to you guys. I don't know if that's a good holiday or not, but I celebrate, I celebrate it from the standpoint of God's love between, uh, between husband and wife and those that he is bringing together. Amen. Now, uh, I, I want to talk to you a little bit more about how we got started. So we get started, and, and this is the part that I didn't plan on sharing. We get started, and uh, we, we take off, and it's mainly youth. I didn't know this, because I've been asked, Pastor, were you ever a youth pastor? Because a lot of pastors transition from being a youth pastor to being a senior pastor, a lead pastor. I never was. I just jumped right into it. But in fact, I actually kind of was a youth pastor. Because our first early years, that we had like two rows of solid youth. And if you know anything about youth, they eat a lot and they don't tithe at all. They, they don't give. And so we bought one box of donuts and they demolished it. We went two boxes of donuts, they demolished it. It didn't matter how many boxes we brought, they finished them. And then they would eat those donuts and we just kept getting more and more youth. And so I was told about this property in our very first year. And so uh, we decided... One of, one, of our, uh, one of the guys I was discipling to come pray on it. So we actually drove down here. This road had not been established yet. It was kind of like an old, old abandoned road. The county hadn't been maintaining it. We drove up. We parked. We jumped the fence. We had permission to do so. And all they said was, yeah, they said, watch out for the bull. They're raising cattle, and there's a bull out there. And if you don't watch for him, and he gets the beat on you, he can light you up. So we're praying, and I'm looking over his shoulder. He's looking over my shoulder. We're looking for this bull, and I don't know where he was, but he didn't bother us, and we prayed, and we walked the property, and, and we just claimed it for the Lord. Can I tell you, 
that when it comes to God, faith is absolutely necessary. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, without faith, you cannot please God. I truly believe it says you're not going to have a relationship with God. And so faith has legs. That means I actually had to get out of my truck, get into this pasture, and literally pray for what... A lot of times we say, well, I'm praying for it, but what are you doing about it? See, because there was something different the way the, the ancients or, or those from, from the early Testament church, how they talked about faith and the way we talk about faith. See, there's a difference with us between believing and action for them they never divorced the two concepts the concept was one concept meaning if you believe you act if you believe you walk if you believe you talk if you believe you act and you move and it, and that's the way you operate and so I want to share with you today have real faith if you believe God has a great marriage in store for you then act on it Start putting into practice those things that he calls you to. Those things that you know may come hard to you. Those things you've been putting off. Those things that you've been making excuses about. If you believe God has an awesome life for you. If you believe that God is moving. If you believe God is calling you. If you believe, then go do it. Yeah. Don't keep waiting. Seize that moment. Live that awesome life. Yeah. Amen. And that's what I want to share with you today. Because the truth is, God has an amazing book of instruction for us. All sorts of things he has included in this book. And he tells us what, how we are to operate in faith. But let's be honest. How many times do we know and we read and we say we believe, but we fall short of the action, of the practice and so I'm not here to get on you. I'm here to encourage you that if we practice a whole new dimension of our walk will be opened up to us, will be opened up to us. So I think, I think sometimes, though, it's a matter of just this relationship. Would you say, let me put it to you this way. Would you say one of the most important things, aspects in a relationship is communication? Communication. It's the same thing with us and God. So a couple was having trouble, so much so that the wife decided to go see an attorney, and she walks into the attorney's office. She says, I want to divorce my husband. So the attorney said, okay. Let me start off with a few questions. She said, okay, yeah, that's fine. And so he, he asks her the first question, and that is, do you have any grounds? She looks at him. She says, um, we have about five acres. <laughs> he says, no, no, kind of puzzled. He, he rubs his brow, shakes his head. He says, no, 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 no. Do you have a grudge? She looks at him and says, no, we don't have a grudge, but we have a carport and a really nice shed. Some of y'all are going, what in the world? He says, no, 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 let me see if I can make myself clear. Um, do you have any complaints? She said, like what, sir? He said, like, like does he beat you up? Oh, no. He never wakes up before me. I'm always up at least half an hour before him. Okay, well, well what about you? Are you, are you, do you ever wake up grumpy, grouchy? She says, oh, no, I've already told you. I never wake him up. I just let him sleep. He finally says, ma'am, I, I don't know if we're exactly communicating. I, I don't know something, but. Why do you want to divorce your husband? She says, the man just can't communicate. <laughs> Can I tell you, sometimes we want to divorce God. And, we, and, and you say, no, I've, I never want to divorce God. No, no, it, we, we don't want to follow his word. We think that he's not communicating. We think it's not going right because God just doesn't care enough to get his point across to us. Can I tell you, he did. He came to this earth. He left us a love letter so that we might know 
how to respond in all of our situations. I want to share that with you from the bottom of my heart. There's some do's and don'ts that make up a great, great relationship. And God has communicated them in his word. The question is, do you have the faith to go for it? To really, really go for it in your relationships. Let's talk about some do's. We'll cover five do's, ten don'ts, and five more do's. And some of you are going, man, this is ambitious. We got 30 minutes. Let's get to it. Number one, top do or practice that I would ask you to to faithfully put legs to, faithfully put into action is practice gratitude. Practice gratitude. Gratitude, did you know gratitude is one of the most healthy human emotions you could, you could give yourselves to? When you practice gratitude, it does something physiological and emotionally in you. It, it, it releases all sorts of good chemicals that prepare you for a great day. It sets your mind right, it sets your emotions right, but not only that, when you practice gratitude with those you love or those that you are in relationship with, not only does it draw you to them, but it draws them to you. And so it is the emotion that brings about closeness. There's plenty of research showing this. And so when you are in a relationship and you begin to share your gratitude for your son, for your daughter, for your loved one, your spouse, not only will they be drawn to you and you to them, but it ties you in a close-knit emotional bond. Now, do you see why God wants you to be grateful to him? Because ultimately, the best thing for you in life is for you and God to be drawn into an emotional bond. And so when you are grateful, literally, emotionally, you are drawing close when you express gratitude to the person that you're expressing gratitude to. Listen to what God's word says. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. That's 1 Thessalonians 5, 18. Give thanks. Notice what it does not say. Let's be very technical here. It doesn't say when you feel like it. It doesn't say if the situation is right, if the circumstances meets your fancy. It says it doesn't matter what's going on because God works, what? All things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And he just needs you to remember that and walk it out in faith. And the first act of faith is to step forward in gratitude and say, Lord, I know this circumstance may not be exactly perfect, but I know one thing, that what the enemy has meant for evil, God will use for good. So I trust you in it. I thank you for it. And ahead of time, I know that you are up to something for my good. Thank you, Lord. And immediately it draws you close in an emotional bond and you can trust him. But most of all, when you practice gratitude among your family, it draws you guys together. Think about what this word is saying, especially in a tough circumstance. In a tough circumstance, do you need to be closer or further apart? You need to be closer. And this is why God says, in every circumstance, find something to be grateful for so that you can draw close together in that emotional bond. Number two, celebrate. Celebrate life. Do you realize that celebrating certain moments brings a team closer together? Coaches will literally find ways to have their team celebrate. Championship coaches do. To find the ways to have their team celebrate. You go, well, what do you mean? Only one big celebration at the end of the year. No, no, no. You celebrate milestones if you're in a good team. A good team will celebrate milestones. We, we got our first win. Guys, let's celebrate. Let's draw that closeness. It's all about closeness. But not only that, it starts helping you grow in your faith and believe. Because many times our faith doesn't grow because we don't take the time to understand, okay, God, you gave us something. We stepped out, or you gave us revelation. We stepped out in believing you, and you met us there. And now, Lord, I have what? I have experience to go with. I have a journal, journey, a, a journal that is, that is journaling my journey. Amen? 
That way I know that you are faithful. And it does the same thing in a relationship. You're basically journaling God's faithfulness in your relationship every time you celebrate. And so I think it's important to celebrate. This is why the Bible says in the book of Psalms 1611, listen to this. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. And at the right hand, at your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Shout to the Lord, all the earth. Break out in praise and sing for joy. Jesus put it this way. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. You know, the opposite of celebrating is complaining and feeling defeated. And you're going to notice these are all practices here. And so whatever you practice, you'll get good at. If you practice defeat, you'll get good at defeat. You know, it's interesting because some teams just know how to win. You ever get that sense when you're watching Alabama, they just know how to win? And some of you are saying they know how to recruit. <laughs> they recruit really, really well. But some teams just know how to win. Do you know it starts with learning how to celebrate? Because if you know and you get good at focusing on defeat, that's what the enemy comes to give you. But I have come to give you life that you might live it in the fullest way possible. Number three, build each other up. That's a, that's a super, super important practice. Build each other up. Listen to what Paul says to the church in Thessalonica. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up. You can always tell if a relationship's gonna, gonna stand the test of time if they take the time to build each other Build them up. You know, I'm always amazed when I get the time to spend with Dr. Rob and Miss Ginger. They're that uh, beloved pastor and wife that we have come and, and, uh, and fill the platform for us sometimes. They're actually going to be here in March, guys. They're going to be here in March, uh, I think second week of March. They're going to bless us. But I get time to spend, I, I, get, I have time to spend with them. We take them out to dinner and all. And the one thing we always know is how they build each other up. Especially Miss Ginger. She builds up Dr. Rob. She talks about, she goes, oh, Rob, he's just as fire as he was. He's, he, he has so much passion and he's always had passion. I thought he was going to calm down. He never calms down. He's just so this. He's so, and she talks about him like he's still the high school quarterback. I don't know if he was the high school quarterback, but I can see him that way. Why? I can see him being a star ever since the beginning. Even now, she talks about him like he is so great. And you know what? They have a great relationship. She, he talks about her like, like she's his homecoming queen. This is important. Again, you get good at what you practice. The Bible says build each other up. Faith has legs. Faith has action. Do you believe it? Are you willing to practice it? You say, I don't know, Pastor. It's going to feel awkward. It may feel awkward at first. Break through the ice. No pun intended. <laughs> Break through the ice. Come on, guys. Break through. Number four, put your phones down. Put your phones down. Do you know study after study after study talks about the negative effects of, of the addiction that people are having to their phones? Not only is it an addiction, but it actually, it actually hampers human ability to connect emotionally in relationships. Study after study after study has shown that it does something chemically to our emotional state, and it keeps us from truly connecting. The other day, I was at the mall, and, and two couples, about 14-year-olds, uh, Cute little guy, cute little girl, hand in hand, they come in, they order, they sit down to eat their food, but from the moment they sat down, they never talked. They were just on their phones, and then they would eat. And I thought, here they are, two couples, they're like on a double date. Did you know double dates are also, uh, within reason, they, they, there are studies that show that's a good thing because it it produces more conversation and more closeness, not only with friends, but with 
but with your significant other. Here they are with their significant other on double date, on a double date with friends, and yet they never said a word because they were so busy with their phones. And then I thought, wow, this generation, right? Isn't that, isn't that what we always think? This generation, they have problems. But then I went to another restaurant later on that week, and I watched an older couple about my age get to the get seated, and as soon as they sat down, they basically they 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 took a picture of the QR code, they started on their phones, and then after they ordered, I thought, okay, they'll put the phones down. Never put their phones down. Spent the whole meal basically on their phones. Here they are on a date, a date designed to draw close. Put your phone down, number five. Play and have fun. I can honestly brag on my wife on this. She loves to play. She will just all of a sudden decide, oh, you think you're bad. And I'm like, well, I'm not, I don't think I'm bad, no. And then she started tickling me and attacking me and playing with me and trying to wrestle me. I'm like, stop, I'm busy. And then I realized, I'm not that busy. Not that busy to enjoy life. And I just preached a message on the playful joyfulness of our Lord, where he was always in the moment. We'll talk about that later, be in the moment. But isn't that part of life, to live it to the fullest, to not get so wrapped up on things that are secondary that we miss the primary? Have fun. Have fun with your kids. Play with them. They won't be little forever. I wish to God my son would wrestle with me like he once did. Now he's too cool. His hair needs to stay in place. Everything is like, you know, nah, I don't want to wrestle, Dad. You know what I'm talking about, guys? How about the don'ts? Let's get to the don'ts. Number one, don't. Don't compare. Don't compare. Nothing steals your joy and your peace quicker than comparing yourself to others. I don't care if you're not married. If you're just talking about a platonic relationship, you start comparing yourself to them, you will either, the minute you compare, you'll either be what? Lower or higher? If you're higher than them, then you might be tempted to feel good and say, good, as long as we stay that way, you can be my friend. You say, no, I don't think, I don't say that. You will not say it, but are you subconsciously feeling it? Because that's the nature of comparison. The nature of comparison leads to competition. In competition, somebody's got to win, somebody's got to lose. And I don't know about you, but I don't like losing. Right? And the minute I feel like a loser, then I'm going to what? I'm going to try to either distance myself from that person, and isn't that the opposite of drawing close? Or I'm going to try to lower them, and how do you lower them? Subversion, sabotage, putting down. I mean, it's never good. How do, you, how do you heighten yourself in a, in a worldly sense? You get braggadocious, you get prideful, you, you start trying to win at anybody else's expense to position yourself in such a way, or you go out and spend money you don't have, come on now, to buy things you don't need to impress people you shouldn't be caring about that much. Think about it with me for a second. Not only does comparison do that, but if you're comparing as a couple, then you start to bring that into your home and it starts to create so much strife between you two because eventually you'll blame one or the other. But if we were more like, you were more like them, or if you did more of that, and if you would do this, then we could get ahead. And the fact is, when you're looking all around, you forget to look at each other and then count on God to promote you because what is for you is for you. Make that a mantra in your home. What is for us is for us. That means God has a perfect plan. Lord, I want to unfold your plan. I don't want to unfold Pastor Chris and Pastor Melissa's plan. That's for them. What's for us is for us. And no one can take it from us except us. We can forfeit it. We can forfeit it by worrying about everyone else. Comparison was an evil thing that got into the Corinthian church. And Paul here, defending his ministry against comparison, has to deal with it. And he says something like this. He says, for we dare not class 
ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves. See? Comparison leads to, I have to commend myself. I have to build myself up. And there's all this division and strife beginning to take place. And Paul says, now i got to address this thing because it's going to tear the church apart. Can I tell you, it'll tear your marriage apart. It will tear your marriage apart and will steal from you joy and peace, the two ingredients you need the most to succeed in a marriage. So here we go. But they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. Paul's saying this is not good. Don't do it. Measure yourself based on what God has called you to do and focus on that and God will increase you. Amen? And there's a piece with saying, Lord, at the end of the day, God, it's only going to matter what you called me to do and did I do it faithfully. And boy, did we, God. Boy, did we. And it felt awesome. How about, I'll, I'll put it in your notes, download it. I got to keep moving. Here we go. Don't envy. Do you realize that comparison leads to envy? I want to say something about envy. Envy is covetousness. And covetous, can anyone tell me where thou shalt not covet is found in the Ten Commandments? It's the tenth one. It's the tenth one because it ties them all together. How do we start? Love your Lord thy God, basically, right? What's the very first one? No other gods, it's me only. So it starts with love the Lord thy God. And how did Jesus say you could summarize all the commandments? Love the Lord your God with everything you have. And then the, uh, the second is like unto it. What does it mean to be like unto it? That means they're linked. You cannot truly love God and hate your neighbor. Isn't that what 1 John says? Some say you love me, but you hate your neighbor. You're a liar. That's what John says, not me. John says, some say that they love God, but they hate their neighbor. That is not true. You cannot love God and hate your neighbor because this is the sign of the cross. I love God and I love others. Therefore, I'm grounded in true love. So watch this. First commandment, love God. Jesus says, love God and love your neighbor. How do you love your neighbor? Number 10. Number 10, thou shalt not covet against God or thy neighbor. Don't covet against your neighbor. Envy destroys love. It's the opposite of love because envy promotes selfishness. And so when you start envying, it comes from comparison, you will allow selfishness to come in and immediately you start to destroy the most important thing you have. And that's true love. Watch what James says. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exists, there will be disorder and every vile practice. Don't worry. How about that one? Don't worry. Be happy. Come on. Can anyone say amen to this one? How many of us worry? Are you like my mom? My mom worries to worry. I can tell you exactly how she expresses love. She thinks love is worry. Because she loves her sons. She loves me. She loves my, uh, my two brothers and my sister. And every time I call her, I know exactly how she's going to answer the phone. She's going to, hi, mijo. Hi, Chris. How are you doing? And as soon as I say fine, she's going to say what? I've been so worried about you. And I'm like, why are you worried? And she'll make up something. She'll say, well, I'm worried about this, or I'm worried about that, or I'm worried about your children, I'm worried about the election, I'm worried about the vaccine, I'm worried about this, I'm worried about the ice storm. So she was so worried about the ice storm, she called all of us and said, I'm going to have to go check on Isaac's dog. Isaac's dog is my brother. My brother is Isaac, and his dog is not my brother, but his dog is my brother's dog, is what I'm trying to say, right? So... She's worried, and, and she's older, and she has a medical condition, and she says, I'm going to have to go out there and risk breaking a hip to check on Isaac's dog, who might be freezing to death. So I call Isaac, because I said, I'll, I'll call Isaac, right? And what a, de a, de uh, a good son does, Isaac's my younger brother. Isaac, man, how you doing, dude? How's your dog? <laughs> what? <laughs> he goes, mom, right? Yeah, mom called me. 
She's worried. I know. She's been threatening to go out there. She's calling all. She called Elizabeth. She called Aaron. She's calling everybody. And so she's worried about the dog. Let me tell you what I did for the dog. The dog has a barn. I put a kennel built specially for the dog inside the barn. And inside that kennel that she has an open access at any time. She can go throughout the entire eight acres but inside the kennel, she has a house, double insulated with hay, and I got a heat lamp. And I got this other mechanism to keep the water from freezing. I've got, this dog sleeps better than me. <laughs> and so I filmed the dog, and I filmed all the work I've done throughout the years, because this dog has been cared for for years, because mom has been worrying for years. Come on, can you hear me? See, because worry is an addiction. You get good at what you practice. And so my mom is worried, and so I showed her the video, and I thought she would be happy. And she goes, yes, but now I'm worried the dog's going to burn to death because <laughs> of the heat lamp. My brother starts laughing. The dog's not going to sit there and be a hot dog, Mom. He's gonna, they're going to run if, if, the, if the barn catches on fire, you know. And I have a special lamp specifically for that. And, and, and so, can, don't worry. Why? Well, first of all, because Jesus says, don't worry. Listen to what he says. This is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food or drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more important than food? Now, now watch what he's doing there. He brings up two absolute necessities. What? Food, drink, and clothing. These are necessities. You cannot live without them. He brings them up, but watch what he does now. He puts them in the proper priority. Because worry is not always based on proper priority. It very seldom is. It, it means getting things out of order. And he's basically saying, when you're worrying, you're out of order. Ooh, watch. Isn't life more important than food? And your, pot, and your body more important than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store up food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable than, uh, to him than they are? Can all your worries add one single moment to your life? Can they extend your life at all? Does it really make sense to worry about clothes when your body's more important than the clothes you're worrying about and you're actually harming the body? You're going to put the clothes on. See, some of us are worrying and you're actually harming your relationships by all your worrying. You're not bringing in a blessing. The worry adds stress and pressure. What happens to a mechanism when you put it under enough pressure? What does it do? It breaks. Some of us are putting so much pressure on our relationships that we're literally breaking them. It's not going to breed life. And Jesus is saying here, I know what you need to really live, and I came to give it to you in the fullest. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Why are you helping him? Can I get an amen from second service? This is, this is, this is good stuff. This is good stuff. Don't hold grudges. This is basically saying, don't be an unforgiving person. I shouldn't tell you how how much the Bible has to say about forgiveness. Forgiveness breeds life to your relationship. All of these practices are, are acts of faith. You say, but it feels counterintuitive to let go of a hurt. Because if I let go of a hurt, then, then I, I let them get away with something. And as long as I hold on to that hurt, then I'm protecting myself and they don't just walk away scot-free. But what if the more you hold on, the more you imprison yourself and cut yourself off from real closeness? And that's exactly what's taking place. Don't miss the moment. Don't miss the moment. 
Take those times to really celebrate. I covered this in a message not too long, just last week or the week before. Don't miss the moment. Take the time to celebrate. Take the time to play and have fun. Take the time to build each other up. Take the time. Don't let worry steal you your joy. Make the most of every single moment. We good? Number six, don't be selfish. You say, well, that's easier said than done. And I put that specifically after don't miss the moment because I truly believe real Christianity is lived moment to moment. Moment to moment. See, when I was introduced to Christianity in the Baptist church, which uh, my heritage is, is I, I love my heritage. The, my, the Baptist denomination for me, not for everybody, for me, was an absolute blessing. My grandfather's a Baptist minister. My, my dad's a Baptist minister. I grew up in the Baptist culture and heritage. And it, 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 I have nothing but positive to say but maybe I didn't understand it all. And as I grew, God used other other, um, denominations to share different things that I was missing. And one of the things that I missed is I thought salvation was a moment in the past. Come on, how many of us have been taught that salvation is the day you accept the Lord as your personal savior? I accept Jesus. I confessed him as Lord. In that moment, he came into my heart, into my life. He changed me forever. And that was the day I was saved. But what if salvation is much more than that? What if salvation is a moment in the past, the moments in the present, and the moments that will forever be lived in the future? What if salvation, according to the doctrine I was taught, but I didn't connect all the dots, are salvation is justification. Justification is the moment I pass from darkness to light. I was justified by the blood of Jesus Christ. I was washed white as snow. Sanctification is what's happening every single moment of my life when I am being transformed into his likeness. What does this have to do with relationships? It has everything to do with relationships because it's the most important relationship that matters, your relationship with Jesus Christ. And so every single moment of my life, I'm being transformed into the what? The likeness of my Savior, Jesus Christ. And so what happens in that moment, Jesus says, is you have to die to yourself. And you know what he uses, at least in my life, To teach me dying to myself, he uses my marriage. (laughs) Am I the only one? He uses relationships to teach me that I need to learn to be selfless, die to myself, and put somebody else's needs ahead of my needs so that I can become more like my Savior who ultimately gave it all for us. Now watch, salvation, moment in time. Moments in the present, I am dying to myself every single moment. And one day I will cross into eternity where I will experience glorification. What? Justification? These are big theological words to describe what I'm describing, that salvation is everything. Justification, sanctification, glorification. And it's all understanding that you embrace the moment and say, how do I give my life away to my children in this moment? How do I give my life away to my family in this moment? How do I put others first in this moment? I forgive, I serve, I build up, I grow. How do I do that? I get in God's word and I understand what it's like to die to self and not be selfish. Seven. Don't hit below the belt. So I got a little philosophical, theological there for a second. Now I'm coming right back to the practical. Don't hit below the belt. What does it mean to hit below the belt? It means sometimes we can get really mean with each other. 
If you want to build real relationship, don't do that. And then analyze why you, ho- why you intended to be mean. I promise you that meanness is coming from a place of hurt in you. From a place of insecurity. You say, no, it's coming from a place of frustration. You deal with insecurity in different ways. Some people feel hurt and sad and they some get frustrated, some get angry, some get resentful. Some, it does, I don't know, but that's coming from a place of insecurity. And typically, you feel like you've been hurt or something's gone on in that argument that you need to retaliate and say, you know what? A, a regular retaliation doesn't seem like it's doing the trick, so I'm going to get you nice and close and I'm going to go, Poof, and hit you where it hurts. And so refuse the, the, refuse the urge to hit below the belt. How about number eight? Don't nag. Don't nag. The Bible says that the continual dripping on a rainy day and a quarrelsome spouse are alike. Some of you are going, Pastor, that's not what it says. But I'm not stupid. <laughs> no, I'm just saying That the Bible, yes, highlights the wife here. Yes, wives are more likely to do that. We'll talk about that later. Not in this sermon, but another. But men can do it too. How about this? The Bible is saying that nagging doesn't breed life into your relationships. Not only between husband and wife, but also between your children. Parents, don't nag your children. Don't. Don't sit there and beat them over and over and over with your words. Make your instruction clear. Tell them once, tell them twice. Discipline, and after the discipline, love them. Love them. I'll never forget, my cousin came to our house, and we used to get spankings. I told you about that last week. And we used to get hard spankings. My dad would deal with us, but he had three boys. And we did some horrible things. Like, I skipped school in first grade for a whole week. So my dad had to be very vigilant, very involved. Well, my cousin comes over to stay one summer with us, and and this is what he said to my dad. He said, Uncle Loopy, would you please talk to my mom? And I thought, oh, shoot, where is this going? He said, I would rather be spanked than nagged to death. He says, when she gets on me, all she does is just harp on me and harp on me and harp on me and harp on me. I've seen the way you treat Aaron, Isaac, and Chris. You spank them, you deal with it, and then you love them, and we move on to the next thing. Ooh. Ooh. Listen to what the Bible says. It's better to live on the corner of your rooftop. I want you to think about that on a night like tonight. (laughs) Number nine. Don't take each other for granted. Don't take each other for granted. That's a good one, right? Number 10, don't be like the world. Can I tell you that the Bible says over and over and over, the world is not for you. The world is not for you. Do you not understand that the world is passing away? The world's ways do not work. It says it in several different ways. In the book of James, it says, don't you understand that if you're friendly with the world, you're an enemy of God? But more importantly, what I want to tell you is when you pattern your relationships after the world, you're going to get what the world gets, and that's ultimately brokenness. And some of you are saying, but pastor, it looks so nice on Facebook. <clears throat> That's two, if you haven't figured this out yet, the world has two relationships or two faces. The face they put on Facebook and the real one. The the one on Facebook, you think, oh, I want to be like that. Can I tell you, look behind the curtain and you'll see, you'll see brokenness. Brokenness. Now we'll finish with a few more practices and then we'll be done. Practice random acts of kindness. Do you know research has been done over and over, and I was reading these research columns, and I don't have enough time to share them all, but you can look them up, that kindness also brings you closer together emotionally. But not only does it bring you close emotionally, but it, it does something in, your, in, in the person you're being kind to, 
it builds trust. They say, we can, I can trust you. I can trust you because you're kind with me, therefore I can open up to you. And so it brings closeness through openness, vulnerability. And, and there's something very, very valuable about true vulnerability between husband and wife. It takes you back, watch this, to the garden. What did Adam and Eve experience in the garden? Ultimate intimacy to the point that they were naked and unashamed. But after the fall, what? They were naked and ashamed. And kindness reverses a little bit of that. You say, how so? Well, think about what the Bible says about love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4. Love is patient and love is kind. And so when you express true, unadulterated love and kindness, you are experiencing the love that God had meant you to have in the garden with true closeness. You say, okay, pastor, now you got to get more specific on how I should be kind. Man, <laughs> Do something for your spouse that they need done without asking, without having them to ask. Bring them a cup of coffee, iron a shirt. You say, well, those are both wife to man or to, uh, wife to the husband. I bring my wife her coffee. I iron for her because I do the ironing in the house. Whatever it is that they need, you do it. Be kind. Be kind. How about this? We got in an argument the other day, and I felt the Lord saying to me, I need you to go in the, in the closet where she was at, putting up some clothes, and tell her you love her, and tell her you're sorry, hold her, and communicate these things. And I said, Lord, but she was wrong. And God said, remember your sermon that you're putting together? This is where faith has legs, means move your legs, and faith has action, move your mouth and begin to share what I shared. I said, but Lord, and then he said, do you remember your prayers that you want to become more like me, that I'm sharing with you how to be kind? Kindness is not about who's right, who's wrong. Kindness is not about, well, I've been doing so much and they, it's their turn. It's not about keeping skin measure. Kindness is about being like Jesus and saying, I'm going to do something that's caring for my loved one. Treat them the way you did at the start if you don't want to see the end. Date your spouse. Make a big deal about them. This has been really helpful to have teenagers because I see what a big deal um, it is to be in love or, or to be exploring, I should say. No, they're not in love. <laughs> they're not in love. I'm refusing that. My, my, uh, my uh, adult daughter is. Now, she's in love, about to be married. But the others are exploring, and, they, and they're excited about this and that. And so the other day, uh, my kids were like, Dad, you know, we got to get something because it's going to be Valentine's, and we want to at least show kindness like you talk about, right? And I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, what do you want? So we drove him to the store, and Evelyn was trying to figure out what to get Laz Jr. I'm going to put her on blast because she needs to learn how to relax a little bit. She gets real tense about these things, and we have Laz's parents right here, so I want them to know that, that I was involved. And so she said, what do you get a guy? You know, I said, well, I would like something sweet to eat. You know, maybe not the flowers and all that, but maybe. So we go to Central Market, and we get two pastries and and something else you got just something little and i said yeah this will work i think a guy would like this i know i would like it do unto others as you would have them do unto you you know live by the golden rule so she's bringing it out and she's getting excited about it and i pull out one of the pastries i just started eating it and she's like what dad and the kids are freaking out and i said hey at the end of the day i'm more important than last I'm more important than, than last. You, you show me, I'm your first Valentine, and then you can give him this other thing. But, but, but it reminded me, you know what? Melissa was a 
big deal to me when I was uh, dating her. She should still be a big deal to me. Amen? I was a big deal to her. She, I should still be that big deal. Number eight, give. Give. Be generous in your giving. If I had one piece of advice to give a young couple, it might be this one. Only one. If they were sitting before me and they said, Pastor, give me one thing that you, you think will set our marriage on the right path, I would say, give to the Lord and be generous with the Lord. Give him your tithe. Give him your talent. Give him your time. Give him the truth. The truth he has given you, give it back to someone else and he'll give you more truth. He'll give you more time. He'll give you more talent. He'll give you more treasure. Give to him. You won't outgive God. Do you realize the number one stressor in couples' homes today and, and what causes more divorce is finances and yet God has the resources but we don't untap them because we don't understand the principle of giving. Listen to what Jesus said. Jesus said, give, and it will be given back to you. How will he give it back? Jesus says, I'll give it back of good measure. That means I'm not going to be chinchy when I measure. I'm going to, watch how he's going to measure. I'm going to press it down. I'm going to shake it to you where you really get that, that sack full. And then I'm going to let it run over, and I'm going to put it in your lap. You're not going to have to go and work as hard as you think. I'm going to take care of it. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. And this is the point. The point is when a young couple starts to realize, man, if I put God first, then he starts to get in the game with me and he blesses my marriage more than I could have ever hoped or imagined or dreamed. If you're here today and you're wondering, would giving to God's house help? I'm here to tell you, yes. And it'll help you with number nine. It'll help you save. This is the story for me. When I first started tithing, we were, well, I, mean, not, I shouldn't say I first started tithing. I stopped tithing for a minute. I was tithing when I was in the secular world, and then I stopped tithing when I became a pastor because I thought, Lord, I'm having to pay for everything. So I'm not going to tithe. Then the church started growing a little bit. and we, I didn't have to pay for everything, but I just kept not tithing because you get used to something. And I felt the Lord prick my heart through my wife. My wife has more faith than me in this area. The person that has more faith should be the leader in this area. My wife has more faith. She says, we're doing wrong. We need to tithe. She says, not only that, we need to make up. So we started doing 11%, 12%. And I said, we'll keep that up until God tells us not to. And then we moved to 13, 14%. We're not that high up. We're just 13, 14%. But we're making up for years past. And so we started tithing. And I noticed something. My God's blessing did not come in the form of increase. If this is what I was making, I continued to make that. You know where God's blessing came? If this is what I was making and this is how much I was spending, he brought back my spending and he brought back my spending and he brought back my spending to a point where things started getting paid off and I started making headway and I started putting into practice some of these financial principles that I've known but hadn't been able to have the resolve to see it through. And he started blessing me to a point that he increased what I had by bringing back my spending. Does that make sense? And so he gave me the ability to save at a higher rate. And today, I have some investments that actually make me a little bit, not a lot, a little bit, but I never would have had them had I not had the ability to save. And it started with the giving. I have a verse that I'll share with you in the notes, so please download the, the notes. First, I mean, number 10, and this is where we finish, pursue God passionately. I can give you verse after verse which says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. That's Proverbs. 
Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways. Acknowledge him and he, will, he shall direct your path. How about Jesus? When he says, don't worry, he also says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You want to have great relationships? Take God's word and devour it. Get in discipleship. Become a real disciple, disciple of your Savior King Jesus. Learn his word. Be determined that his word will guide your path. Lord, let thy word be a what? A lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I want to follow in your ways, God. You walk and let me emulate you. I want to walk like my Savior. I want to talk like my Savior. I want to feel like my Savior. I want to be like my Savior. And the only way I can do that is to get in his word, get in discipleship, start learning from other brothers, start really working this thing out. It's not going to be easy, but the more you call on it, the more you ask for it, he'll prick your heart and he'll say, go into that closet and talk to that woman, talk to that wife. Remember how much you love her. And the enemy's going, don't do it. But greater is his word still in my life because why? Because I'm giving it that room. Every morning we spend at least 45 minutes with our children reading through his word. Not because, because I'm something special, but for too long I've been saying, you know how many pastors will preach the word but never share it in their home? I'm like, no, God, this has to be something that I live by. I want to look like you. I want to feel like you. I want to love like you. It's not good enough for me to be at this level. I want to continue moving. I want to continue honoring you, Lord. This is the number one thing I see in relationships. They get stagnant and they refuse to get in God's word and let it bring the vitality that it does. So I used to talk, and this is where I finished, I used to talk about kiss your wife passionately, take her on a date, do all these things. Yeah, I even ran off some people that way. I didn't know the Californians could be so funny about things. There was a big family of Californians. They had come, they loved our church, and I said, you need to kiss your wife passionately. And I said, and kiss her on the lips with your mouth open, you know. And I grabbed my wife and I just kissed her a little. I just went like that. But, but I said, you need to do it for 30 seconds, no less, every day. And they went, <gasps> never came back. <laughs> so I don't know. But, but that works too. But let me tell you what works even better. Amen. You get into God's word, you'll want to kiss. You'll want to play. You'll want to do all of these things I talked about. And you'll naturally be encouraged to stop doing the things the world says it's okay. I love you, church. So this is what we're doing. We got to get out of here before it freezes over on us. But I want you to take your communion today. And I want you to acknowledge that Christ's gift on the cross ultimately was a new beginning for us. It was a new beginning. He gave us a fresh new start, and he specializes in new starts when it comes to relationships. And so I want you to picture that relationship you need his fresh start in, a reset, so to speak. It might be with a friend, it might be with a family member, it might be with a son or daughter, a mother or father, it might be with a wife or a husband. But in Jesus' name, I want you to say, Lord, you make all things new at Calvary. You continue to make things new. I give you this relationship, Lord, and I ask you to help me restart. Thank you for giving your body and your blood and giving us all fresh starts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, Lord.
we honored you. I love you, church. Have a great, great week.